The National Broadcasting Company presents, transcribed, Sir Lawrence Olivier in Theatre Royal. This is Lawrence Olivier. I've chosen today a story by one of our favorite modern writers in England, Graham Greene, which has been adapted as a radio play. It is, perhaps a little unexpectedly, and I think delightfully, a comedy. I'm going to play the part of Nicholas Fenwick. And so now let me tell you Graham Greene's story, When Greek Meets Greek. <laughs> This is a story about Oxford University. Well, about Oxford, anyhow. And the story takes place during the last war. It, uh, it takes a war to upset the routine at Oxford. Well, at Oxford University. And that's exactly what had happened. In fact, such a thing could never have happened at Oxford, except in wartime. After all, the university's been there a long time. Even New College, which was new in 1379. As you probably know, 19 colleges go to make up Oxford University. There's Balliol, Brasenose, Harford and Magdalen, Lincoln and Queen's, Jesus and Oriel, and, uh, well, 19 of them. But one college that's never been at Oxford is St. Ambrose's. At least, there was never a St. Ambrose College at Oxford until the last war. Ah, that'll be Prisket. Let him in, my dear, will you? All right, Uncle Nick. We trust that the enclosed... Syllabus? How the devil do you spell syllabus? S Y L A. Hmm. Looks funny somehow. Oh, hello, Prisket. Come in. Come in. Uh, well, uh, how's the college doing? St. Ambrose is splendid. Getting out the syllabuses at this very moment. Ah. Come into the uh, common room, hmm. and you shall know all. Ah. Put your hat and coat on the sewing machine there. Ah. Rather cluttered up, I'm afraid. One of these days, we must build, Prisket, plan and build a St. Ambrose is worthy of our ideal. That's right. I brought you some more of my pills. Invaluable, Prisket. Ah, if only you'd taken a degree, the Society of Apothecaries would have been enough. Enough for what? I would have appointed you a resident medical officer of St. Ambrose. Oh, well, I am a chemist. Mm, I won't do, Prisket. It'd look bad on the syllabus. Oh. Uh, could we be introduced, Uncle? Intro oh, yes, of course. This is my niece, Elizabeth Prisket. How do you do? How do you do? I'm going to train her to act as bursar to the college. Now, the strain of being both bursar and president of the college is upsetting my stomach. Oh, well, that's really why I brought... <laughs> yes, the pills. Thank you. And what do you think of the college, Miss Fenwick? Uh, my name's Cross. Oh, I think it's a good idea. I'm surprised my uncle thought of it. In a way, it's partly my idea. Oh, oh I see. You see, I said to your uncle, with all these colleges being taken over by the military and the tutors having nothing to do, they ought to start teaching by correspondence. And a glass of audit ale, Prescott. Thank you. Of course, I hadn't thought of all this. The common room, I mean, and St. Ambrose. Yes. My niece knows very little of the setup. I've uh, merely given her a general picture of our activities. Yes, as I see it, Uncle's running a swindle called St. Ambrose's no, College, no, no, Oxford. Not a swindle, my dear. The advertisement was very carefully worded. Every phrase was checked against every man his own lawyer. Useful book, Prisket, I hope you know it. Well, as the brochure says, war conditions prevent you going up to Oxford, St. Ambrose's, Tom Brown's Old College. Nice touch there, don't you think? St. Ambrose's, Tom Brown's Old College has made an important break with the tradition. For the period of the war only, it will be possible to receive tuition by post wherever you may be, whether defending the empire on the cold rocks of Iceland or on the burning sands of Libya, in the main street of an American town or a cottage in Devonshire. No, you've overdone it, Uncle. You always do. Mm. That hasn't got a cultured mm. ring. It won't catch anybody but saps. <laughs> My dear, there are plenty of saps. Well, go on. <laughs> well, I'll skip that bit. Degree diplomas will be granted at the end of three terms instead of the usual three years. That gives a quick turnover. One can't wait for money these days. Gain a real Oxford education at Tom Brown's old mm. college. For full particulars, the tuition fees, battles, etc., right to the bursar. But do you mean to say the university can't stop that? Anybody can start a college anywhere. I'd never said it was part of the university. But battles, uh, they mean board and lodging. In this case, it's quite a nominal fee to keep your name in perpetuity on the books of the old firm. I mean the old college. And the uh, postal tuition? Uh, Prisket here is science tutor. I take history and the classics. I thought that you, my dear, might tackle economics. I don't know anything about them. <laughs> well, of course, neither will our undergraduates. As a matter of fact, I'd already thought of keeping the examinations on the simple side, uh, within the capacity of the tutors. <laughs> there's an excellent public library here, you know. And another thing, the fees are returnable if the diploma degree is not granted. 
You mean... Oh, nobody will ever fail. And you've actually started? You mean you're beginning to get results? Well, of course. I waited until I could see the distinct possibility of at least 600 a year for the three of us before I wired you, my dear. And today, beyond all my expectations, I have received a letter from Lord Driver. He, Lord Driver, is entering his son at St. Ambrose's. But how can he come here? Well, that's just it. He can't. He's in the army. Oh. The drivers have always been a military family. I looked them up into Brett's period. So there you are, Miss Cross. Mm. What do you think of it? I think it's rich. <laughs> Only one thing missing. You haven't arranged a boat race. <laughs> there you are, Prisket. I told you she was a girl of ideas. <laughs> Now the scene shifts to London, where a figure of obvious, almost painfully obvious gentility is busily spreading spent tea leaves round the roots of a spotted aspidistra in a rented sitting room off the Maribyrn Road. Oh, lovely plot, my dear. How it thrives. Now, you can't get round me with a bit of soft soap like that, Mr. Driver. Look at this letter that's just arrived. See what it says on the envelope? Mm. Lord Driver. What's this Lord Driver business? My Christian name, my dear. Lord Driver, like Lord George Sanger or uh, Duke Ellington. Then why don't they put Mr. Lord Driver on the envelope? Hello. Ignorance, my dear, just ignorance. Oh, I don't want any hanky panky from my house, Mr. Driver. It's always been honest. Well, perhaps they didn't know whether I was an esquire or just a plain mister, so they left it blank. Oh, it's sent from St. Ambrose's College, Oxford. People like that ought to know. Yes. In any case, what are the likes of you corresponding at Oxford College about? My dear, I may have been a little unfortunate. It may even be that I spent a few years in Chokey, but I have the rights of a free man. And a son in quad, oh, like father, like son. Please, please, not in quad, my dear. Reform school. A Boston is quite another institution. It is a kind of college. Like St. Ambrose. Well, perhaps not quite of the same rank, but uh, if you please, just let me have my letter. Oh, well, there's your letter, Lord Driver. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, good. Mm-hmm. Well, never mind that. Mm-hmm. What's it say? My son has been accepted for St. Ambrose College, Oxford. This is a letter from the president. He writes, uh, yes, well, uh, it'll be my great pleasure to pay personal attention to your son's career at St. Ambrose's. In these days, it is an honor to welcome a member of a great military family like <laughs> yours. <laughs> great military family. Oh, excuse me. The only army you've been near is the Salvation uh, Army on the receiving please, end. Please, please. After all, it's only fitting that my son should go to Oxford. But how can he go? He won't be out of jail. <coughs> Reform school yes. for another six months, will he? Well, uh, no, but when I say he'll go to Oxford, that is a figure of speech. The course for which he's been enrolled is a correspondence course. What do they call it here? Oh, yes, a postal tuition course. Oh, one of them. Oh, I didn't know they did that at Oxford. The wartime emergency, my dear. Oh, yes, it will be, won't it? But won't they let him do his lessons in Boston? I mean, filling his forms and well, I hardly suppose they would. I suppose as a sort of college themselves, they'd feel it was a sort of breach of professional etiquette for one of their students to correspond even with a college like St. Ambrose. Oh, it would look a bit funny, wouldn't it? Mm. Then having to write to Boston. In any case, it's a degree I'm thinking about. An Oxford degree. I thought of it as a sort of welcome home for the boy when they let him out. Well, then, who's going to take the course for him? You're not. Uh, no, not me exactly. No, I remember the first trait I was serving three years in Wormwood Scrubs. There was a man there they called Daddy. I've always kept in touch with him. Reverend Simon Milan, his real name was. Oh, well, quite a scholar. Well, in quad, a clergyman. Oh, only a short time prisoner, of course. Oh, we all were the Scrubs. Come to think of it, a prison is almost a university in itself. With the knowledge you find there, doctors, financiers, clergy. And you're going to let him take the course in your son's name? Oh, I'll pay him, of course. Marvellous man. I can still hear him now, talking Latin to the warders. And so, yet another illustrious name was entered in perpetuity on the books of the old firm, St. Andrews's College, Oxford. For the three terms of the academic year, papers were received from the Honourable Fred Driver, papers which showed a deep and uncommon understanding of Latin, at least. I've been thinking, as this is my third term here, it's about time I had arrived. Now, my dear... I should is... like another three pounds a week. We are such stuff as dreams are made on. What? Yes, yeah, rounded by sleep. <laughs> and these, our cloud-capped towers... You're misquoting. ...vanished into air. Into thin air. You've been correcting the English papers. Unless you allow me to think. To think rapidly and deeply, there won't be any more examination papers. Oh, trouble? I've always been a Republican at heart. I don't see why we want a hereditary peerage. Now, this man, Lord Driver, why should a mere accident of birth... You mean he won't pay his fees? No, 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 not that. A man like that expects credit. He's right that he should have credit. But he's written to say that he's coming down tomorrow to see his boy's college. 
fat-headed, sentimental old fool. Well, this is it. I knew you'd be in trouble sooner or later. That's the sort of damn fool, comfortless thing a girl would say. Why, it just needs brains, in fact. It's quite simple as soon as you begin to think. Mm, glad you find it so. Well, of course. I'll meet him at the station with a taxi and take him to one of the real colleges, say, uh, say, Balliol. Lead him straight through into the inner quad, and there you'll be, just looking as mm. if you'd come out of the master's lodging. Mm, no, it won't work. How do you mean it won't work? Well, of course it'll work. No, he'd know it was Balliol. Nonsense. If he knew the first thing about Oxford, he wouldn't be sap enough to enroll his son at St. Ambrose's, would he? Mm. Well, if you put it like that, no, I suppose he wouldn't. Very well, then, if I tell him Balliol, St. Ambrose's, how should he know the difference? Mm -hmm. Of course, these well-known military families are a bit crass. It'll work like a charm. <laughs> now, there you'll be in the inner quad. You'll be mm. in an enormous hurry, mm. or consecration or something. <laughs> you'll whip him round the hall, the chapel, the library, hand him back to me outside the master's. Mm. Nobody will be there to make any trouble. They'll just think you're a couple of sightseers. <laughs> then I'll take him out to lunch, because you're far too busy, <laughs> and see him back onto his train. It's simple. <laughs> you know, Elizabeth, sometimes I think you're a terrible girl. Terrible. <laughs> Is there nothing you wouldn't think of? Well, I wouldn't have thought up St. Ambrose's in the first place, probably. Oh, 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 oh. Anyhow, now we've got it on our hands, we've got to make the old place look good. Well, it couldn't possibly look better than Balliol, could it? Mm, no, no, no. Uh, come to mention it, my dear, it, it couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> In a moment, we continue Theatre Royal with Sir Lawrence Olivier. There's more fine dramatic listening in store tonight when husband and wife team Frederick March and Florence Eldridge interpret the leading roles of Arthur Miller's prize-winning Death of a Salesman. That's on NBC Star Playhouse. And a new dramatic feature, Inheritance, presents the story of Oliver Pollock, an American businessman who played a significant but little-known part in the American Revolution. Hear this entry in the regular Sunday night series presented in cooperation with the American Legion, a feature designed to highlight turning points in American history and the freedom that is our heritage. That's Inheritance tonight. Meet the Press then comes to you with the evening's prominent guest, Eleanor Roosevelt, who answers the barrage of questions fired by a panel of top newspaper reporters. Lawrence Spivak is moderator. All ahead tonight on NBC. And now is as good a time as any to note the Monday through Friday regular listening treats. Every weekday morning, there's your favorite comedy man, Bob the Housewife's friend, Hope. This week with lovely guest Ann Miller of dancing and acting fame. She and the ski-nosed connoisseur will debate the comparative merits of soft shoe and the Miller dancing style. And the screen lovely will also tell Hope and the listening audience about her film debut and how her youth detoured her on her path to stardom. All this plus the Hope Choice for Woman of the Week on the Bob Hope Morning Show. Listen tomorrow. Also among the regulars is the outstanding commentator Pauline Frederick with facts on national and international doings. And your newsman on the go, Alex Dreyer. Plus a host of experts who join Jim Fleming in bringing you the heart of the news. Then you won't forget your homey friends, Fibber McGee and Molly, who frolic through another week of misinvolvements and pay their usual chatty visits with all the neighbors in the little town of Wistful Vista. Yes, there's some fine listening in store tonight and another good week ahead on NBC. And now we continue Theatre Royal with Sir Lawrence Olivier. The next day, Elizabeth met Lord Driver at the station and brought him into the town by taxi. There could be no mistaking him as he stepped out of his first-class carriage that air of slightly decayed gentility, the monocle hanging on its cord, the baggy trousers and the rather shabby hat. He looked like any eccentric peer in the land. Certainly nobody could have suspected that he wasn't a peer. Or could they, perhaps? Something about him worried Elizabeth slightly. It was almost as though he were afraid of her. He was so ready to fall in with her plans. It's really unfortunate that you should have chosen today of all days, Lord Driver. Mm -hmm. uh, my uncle, uh, the President, was most upset that he'll be able to see so very little of you. He asked me to make his apologies for him in advance. Oh, I, I, I don't want to be any trouble right here, no trouble at all. Very good of the President to receive me at all. Well, he'll be able to give you a very quick look around the college, of course. Yes. Uh, you've never been over St. Ambrose's, I gather? No, I'm afraid I never have. Oh. I don't want to cause him any bother, of course. It's just the bricks of the dear old place, you know. You mustn't mind me being a sentimentalist, my dear. Oh, of course not. 
Uh, were you at Oxford yourself? No, no, no. The drivers, I'm afraid, have neglected the things of the mind. A family of soldiers, you understand. One generation to the next. Soldiers, all of them. Well, I suppose even the soldier needs brains. Well, I, uh, <clears throat> We believe so in the Lancers. Oh, what a pity there aren't any Lancers anymore. Oh, oh me... What about your son? What's he in? Uh, my son. Oh, yes, my son. Well, he's undergoing a sort of military training. Mm, at Sandhurst? Sandhurst? No, not Sandhurst. Oh. No, uh, more, sort of more tactical, I gather. You mean a uh, uh, battle school? Yes, that'll be it, no doubt. Of course, I hear very little about it. Top secret, you know. Yes, of course. Well, here we are. The Ambrose's College. Ah. It's a fine old place, isn't it? The very heart and soul of Oxford. Gad, yes. So, this is St. Ambrose's. You know, it's exactly as I pictured the dear old place. Well, obviously, your lordship has a vivid imagination. Oh, here's my uncle. Ah, here you are, Elizabeth. And this is our distinguished guest. Uh, yes, Uncle Nick. This is Lord Driver, Dr. Nicholas Fenton. Delighted to meet you, my lord. A great honor, sir. Uh, Mr. President, uh, how do you do? Well, uh, Uncle, if you'll excuse me, I'm sure you'll have a great deal to show Lord Driver. Mm -hmm. I'll be back to take him for lunch in half an hour. Uh, thank you, my dear. Don't be any later than half an hour. That's a good girl. Uh, charming girls, how your niece. <laughs> I'm glad to hear you say that, my lord. She's, she's very home-loving. Yes. <laughs> yes, far more to her than most modern girls, I think. Uh, our famous elms, my lord. St. Ambrose's Rooks. Uh, Cooks? No, 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 no. Rooks. In the elms over there. Ah, yes. Rooks in the elms. <laughs> yes. Ah, those wonderful elm trees. One of our great modern poets wrote about them. St. Ambrose Elms, oh, St. Ambrose Elms. And he went on to mention them. Uh, St. Ambrose Rooks, uh, calling in wind and rain. Pretty, very pretty. Uh, it's nicely turned, I think. Turned? Mm -hmm. Oh, the poem you mean, yeah. I was talking about your niece. Oh, my niece. Ah, yes, indeed. Uh, this way to the hall, my lord. I'm up these steps. Uh, so often trodden, you know, by Tom Brown. Tom Brown? Who is he, the poet? Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. no. The, the great uh, Tom Brown, one of rugby's famous sons. Oh. Tom Brown's school days, remember? Mm. Yes, yes. <laughs> ah, yes, she'll make a fine wife and mother. Young men are beginning to realize that the flighty ones are not what they want for mm. a lifetime, Dr. Finney. True, 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 my lord. Whoever wins her can feel proud. She'll make a fine hostess. You can take my word for that. I've no cause to doubt it, sir. Mm. I and my son have talked very seriously about marriage. He takes rather an old-fashioned oh, view. Oh, he'll make a good husband, believe me. I <laughs> might have deduced as much from his examination papers. Oh. Our founder, sir. No, 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 the portrait there on the wall. <laughs> Some of our guests have done me the honor to notice a slight resemblance between us, um, allowing, of course, for the wig. Yes, mm. allowing for the wig, perhaps. Yes, I could see it myself. Uh, no relationship, of course. Oh, no, no, no relationship. Just, we say, a happy coincidence. And, uh, the great poet Swinburne. Ah, Swinburne. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. <laughs> we sent him down. You mean, yes. expelled him? <laughs> From St. Ambrose? Yeah. Good and bad moral. I'm glad to hear you're strict about those, sir. Ah, your son is in safe hands at St. Ambrose's, my lord. In safe hands. It makes me very happy, yes. Uh, fine brushwork, that. Uh, very fine. Now, religion. I believe in religion. Basis of the family. Backbone of the race. My own sentiments, my lord. With which I'm glad to say my niece uh, cordially agrees. Excellent, excellent. Uh, you know, our young people ought to meet Dr. Perry. Well, it's a perfectly splendid idea. Yes, indeed, I agree. That's to say, uh, I should have explained. They ought to meet if my son passes his examinations and obtains his degree. Oh, you can set your mind at rest there, my lord. He'll certainly get his degree. I'd almost go so far as to give you my word on that. Well, that's most gratifying. Really very gratifying. Indeed. <laughs> He'll be on leave in a week or two. Why shouldn't he take his degree in person? I mean, come here to receive it. Uh, my, my, my lord, I'm sorry. I, I, uh, deeply sorry. Uh, but there'd be certain difficulties. Difficulties? Yes. Why, isn't it the custom with degrees to be received at the college? Uh, 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 not for postal graduates, my lord. No. And the Vice-Chancellor likes to make a small distinction. But, my Lord Driver, in the case of so distinguished an alumnus, I suggest that I should be deputed to present the degree to your son personally in London. Well, uh, I'd have liked him to see his college, Dr. Oh, Bennett. so he shall, in happier days. After all, as you can see for yourself, so much of the college is shut at present. I'd like him to visit it for the first time when his glory is restored. Allow me and my niece to call upon you in London. Well, uh, uh, I, I'm afraid we're living very quietly over you know, the wall, of course. Not serious financial trouble, I hope. Oh, dummy. No, I'm so glad. And now, after this all too brief glimpse, let us rejoin, my dear girl. There could be no doubt about it. The Honorable Frederick Driver was St. Ambrose's most notable undergraduate. 
The college had not been fulfilling expectations of late, and the postman was paying only irregular calls at the master's lodging. Mr. Fenwick seemed to be far less anxious about the fact than, than Elizabeth had expected. Indeed, it almost seemed as though he had begun to regard the college as only a step towards something else. Exactly what, she couldn't make out. Well, it's lucky that somebody still sends in his papers regularly. <laughs> yes, that dear boy. I've just marked the Honourable Frederick 100% for classics. Extraordinary. I need quite a good crib to keep up with him. It's not often that Latin and Greek go with military genius. A truly remarkable boy. Well, he's not so hot on economics. Mm. Well, we mustn't demand too much book learning from a soldier, my dear. I suppose he really is a soldier. Of course he's a soldier. Lord Driver told me so himself. Mm, that's what I mean. Oh, well, we'll soon see, anyhow. <laughs> yes. Only another week, and I shall have the pleasure of taking you up to town to hand him his diploma personally. You know, one thing struck me as rather funny. Mm, no, sir, Penny. This idea of Lord Driver meeting us at Paddington Station instead of our going round to his house. Oh, what's funny about that? Well, nothing, except that we met him on the station here at Oxford. What? The two cases are absolutely different. We met him on the station for a very good reason. He's meeting us at Paddington because his house has just been bombed. He told us that in his letter. Mm, I suppose it must have been a delayed action bomb. Delayed action bomb? Why? Because there hasn't been a raid on London for the last six months. Oh. In a moment, we continue with Theatre Royal. How many of us pause at this time before Easter, the season of hope and joy to dwell upon our blessings bestowed by a divine power. And as we lift our hearts in gratitude, do we wonder what it would be like suddenly to be stricken by a crippling disease or to be crippled by an accident? Many are, including little children. And it is from us, the whole and hearty and humble, that help must come. Let us show by our purchase of Easter seals from the Society for Crippled Children that we do think of our fellow man as our brother and of helpless children who depend upon us as our own, to help. In the true spirit of Easter, let's give a real Easter gift to crippled children, bringing to them the chance for new life and joy. Let's end our contribution now to the Easter Seal Society for Crippled Children. And now we return to Theater Royal. <laughs> But Mr. Fenwick preferred to retain his trust in human nature. In due course, he packed a Bachelor of Arts gown and mortarboard in his suitcase, along with a Bible and a specially printed diploma, which had been rolled off for him by a friend with a firm of Anglo-Catholic printers. And with Elizabeth at his side, he duly arrived at Paddington Station. From there, the party of four retired to a private room at one of London's great hotels. Now, oh, Patrick, I hope you're fully conscious of the honor that's being bestowed upon you. Yes, Dad. Just as long as we can get it over with. Oh, I hadn't an elaborate ceremony in mind, my boy. No, not in these dark wartime days. Merely by virtue of the powers in me vested and in recognition of your abilities as fully proved to our examiners, may I have the pleasure of handing you this uh, degree diploma. And in token of your admission to our role of Bachelors of the Arts, this cap and gown, which have never, I may say, been more richly deserved by one of our new graduates. Oh, thanks, Dr. Fenwick. I don't exactly know what I've done to deserve it. I... Don't seem to have done anything at all. <coughs> Sorry, Dad. I... Anyhow, do I have to put them on? Oh, well, I think you owe your distinguished father that little gratification, my boy. All right. <laughs> It'll fit better when my hair grows again. The Honorable Frederick Driver certainly did wear his hair uncommonly short. Almost a crew cut, or almost a prison crop. Also, he had a scar on his cheek and a rather suspicious and sullen scowl on his face. Even so, he had a certain charm to him, and Elizabeth found him quite good-looking. The way that Lord Driver and her uncle, the President, left them alone together confirmed her deepest suspicions. There could only be one thing at the back of everybody's mind. Well, Fred, what's the idea? Search me. I suppose they're planning a wedding. I wouldn't mind. You'd have to get leave from your CO, wouldn't you? From my who? CO? What's that? Never mind. How do you like the army? If they keep you at it like your father says, it must be like being in prison. <laughs> it is, rather. Oh, come clean, Fred. Your father's not Lord Driver. Oh, yes, he is. Oh, no, he isn't. Any more than my uncle's the president of a college. <laughs> <laughs> As a matter of fact, I'm, I'm just out of reform school, Borstal. What about you? Oh, I haven't been to prison yet. Ha-ha. Uh -huh. You'll never believe me, but that ceremony and all that, it, it looked phony to me from the start. Of course, Dad swallowed it. My uncle swallowed your father and you. I, I couldn't quite. 
I'm not surprised. I told him he'd never get away with it, but that's Dad all over. Uncle Nick's exactly the same, just too silly for words and twice as gullible. Uh, by the way, what did they send you to Borstal for? Oh, nothing that I did, just trying to cover up for the old man. Mm. You probably had to cover up for your uncle before now. Oh, have I? Poor dears, the things we have to do for them. That's right. I mean, next time you'll have to get himself out of the mess. Once is enough, so far as I'm concerned. Me too. <laughs> I'll let you be a warning to me. They fell in love, for no reason at all, in the park, on a bench to save tuppences, planning their fraud on the old frauds they knew they could outdo. Well... Too bad the wedding's off. I, I'm sorry, in a way. But it doesn't have to be off, does it? I'm still free. Well, we, we might discuss it, mightn't we? Why not? My uncle had certainly put up 500-odd to marry me off to Lord Driver's son. He would? Mm -hmm. Well, come to think of it, I'll bet Dad would cough up as much to marry me off to the President's niece. You know what? What? I think we ought to make both the old dears happy. And do you know what? What? So do I. Then they went back. They almost felt sorry for the old fools as their faces lit suddenly, simultaneously up because everything had been so easy. And then darkened with caution as they squinted at each other. This is very surprising. <laughs> My goodness, young people work fast. <laughs> <laughs> All night, the two old men planned their settlements. And the two young ones sat happily back in a corner watching the elaborate fencing. With the secret knowledge that the world is always open to the young.